Sadie is not only an actor, but also a passionate advocate for women in film industry. Today, she will share her insights on the opportunities and challenges faced by women in, the in this dynamic field. Through her work and experiences, Sadie inspires us to break barriers and strive for gender equality. Please give a big round of applause for Sadie Strang. Wrote 
and portrayed the lead character in. I never questioned that I was capable of doing that because she showed me it was possible for women to find success as artists. Since the Union Pilot, which I funded, for my series has wrapped, many women have contacted me to say that they have started writing their own series. Seeing my success showed them that their success was possible. That is the power of representation. When you pursue a career in the film industry, you inspire other women to do the same. We as women are far more powerful than they want us to think. Even when, they, when we are the only ones in the room that look like us. The film industry may be flawed, but it is changing. Female artists have more opportunity now than ever before. The growth we've seen in the last 10 years has often come from women like you standing up for the changes they want to see on set. Actress Allison Stoner has spread awareness for the rights of child actors through her podcast, Dear Hollywood. Viola Davis frequently uses her platform to advocate change for social justice and equality for women of color in the industry. Not to mention artists like Margot Robbie, Reese Witherspoon, and Kaylee Kyoko have founded their own production companies to create content that feature female characters with depth and urgencies. These women in the arts were able to acknowledge where the film industry needed improvement and actively use the power they have to create change so it was safer for us to enter. Now, there's no denying that those women are celebrities with money, influence, and resources, so it might feel easy to compare yourself and feel incapable of that level of success, but I want everybody here to keep in mind that all of them and any other celebrity in the media was once you. Everyone has to start somewhere. That means that every single person in this room is also capable of reaching their full potential in the arts. It's possible. So, let's get into it. Let's get into specifics about opportunities the film industry is offering to women right now to create a long-term career in filmmaking. I'll be focusing mostly on acting and producing rather than crew positions simply because that is my area of expertise. A lot of people don't know this, but I was it was never a goal of mine to become a film producer. I just wanted to act. Acting was my only priority. The reason I got into producing was really to give myself better opportunities as an actor. I started auditioning for projects in 2019, and I realized fairly quickly that when you're a white blonde woman, you're often reduced to just your appearance. The roles I usually got auditions for were very often bimbo love interests, or mean girls, or just someone really shallow. These characters were usually just there as an extension of the male lead, and very seldom were written like actual women. At first, I found this kind of funny. After a while though, I felt a little irritated. It was so surreal to go from playing these one-dimensional characters to then returning to my own life. At the time, when I wasn't on set, I was always in my best friend's basement. We'd stay up all night discussing different philosophies and debating different existential theories. I'd often complain to my friends about how I couldn't think of a single show that depicted women even remotely similar to us. That was my motivation to try my hand at script writing. To my surprise, I was actually pretty good at it. I started writing scripts about smart women who would use existentialism to get out of absurd situations. This became the plot of my original series, Why Can't You Understand Me?, which I am currently pitching as I started developing Why Can't You Understand Me in 2020, I spent a lot of my free time researching female producers. Upon my research, I focused a lot on Megan Fox and Margot Robbie's career. Believe it or not, they're actually pretty similar. Megan Fox is a very smart, funny woman, but because she's really attractive, people limit her to her appearance. So she often only plays these one-dimensional characters that are really just there to look attractive. Sound familiar? 
That's not Megan's fault at all, though. She doesn't have control over what she gets past us. Very few actors do. It's the industry that trapped her in that hot girl box. The same thing started happening to Margot Robbie at the beginning of her career. She was a beautiful woman, and that's all people saw. What Margot did that was quite clever, though, was she started producing. As a producer, Margot could control what roles she was playing. She picked roles for herself that were all very different, but equally fleshed out. She picked characters that were weird or angry or just really unexpected for her. This allowed audiences to see her as more than just an attractive woman, but rather a talented actress with range. Now, Margot Robbie can play any role she wants, whereas Megan Fox is still often looked at as just a hot woman, despite being very capable of more. This research really showed me that if I wanted to get away from the bimbo love interest, it had to be my responsibility to write those roles. No one was going to hand them to me, and I needed to prove that I was more than just a pretty blonde. As of right now, I have about nine different scripts that I've written that feature very contrasting characters for me to play. I still audition like everybody else, but now I'm not relying on other people to develop my career. Producing allowed me to take control over a career that I originally had no control over. Being a female producer in my 20s, I've had to be very loud and be my own advocate. I've been in plenty of situations where people assume very little of me and don't take me seriously, even by people that were on my side and trying to help me. It's just like an unconscious default people have as a direct result of the patriarchy. Unfortunately, as women, we always have to prove that we're smarter than we look and more capable than people assume. I've been in many meetings where I'll make a suggestion that is dismissed or discredited, and then a man will make the exact same point I made and everyone listens and takes it seriously. That has, made, that has happened to me so frequently, even by men that are close friends of mine. As women, we are always assumed incorrect until proven otherwise no matter what our qualifications are or how much experience we have. It's this society's default. There's power in knowing this though. When you know which challenges you're going to face ahead of time, you can prepare for them. For example, last year I had a meeting with a producer and I did not want to attend this meeting at all. I knew going into it that this man was going to try to overpower me, attack me, and blame me for things that really weren't valid. So going into this meeting, I needed some kind of plan. I called a friend of mine who has a career in psychology and asked her for advice. She gave me a list of vocabulary that I could use like armor. I was advised to make statements like, I feel this way, instead of saying, this is what happened so the man wouldn't feel discredited. She told me to always stay calm and composed so I could never be labeled as overreacting or emotional. She showed me how to phrase points I wanted to make in ways that would come across as validating to him, but stay true to what I wanted. Thank God for that preparation because that meeting was one of the worst experiences I've ever had as a producer. You would never know that with my experience in the moment though, because the level of professionalism I maintained the entire meeting. The person I met with was very unreasonable and essentially just verbally assaulted me for two hours over very minuscule issues. I could literally hear, I'm just Ken, playing over the entire meeting. That's how childish this guy was acting. I never let those feelings show though. Instead, I maintained a calm composure the entire meeting, which surprisingly made him angrier. He wanted to get under my skin. He wanted some big emotional reaction out of me, but I never gave that to him. Instead, I was able to validate his feelings while also getting my points across. So eventually, he had no choice but to calm down and listen to what I had to say. It was a pretty negative experience, but I learned a lot. I learned that if you're polite and speak clearly, you can say almost anything to anyone. 
You can work with people that make you feel uncomfortable by knowing that their behavior has more to do with, with them than it does with you. It's important that you don't internalize any behavior like that. You've got to get into the habit of telling yourself, nothing in this industry is personal, even if it is personal. Toxic men in positions of power is something you'll face a lot in this industry. But if you can hold your own against them like I did in that meeting, you'll go very far in life. Right now, there are a lot of opportunities for female producers. Companies offering grant monies now have categories that are just for women-focused content. There's even more categories for producers of color. That's because there's a bigger demand for inclusion than ever before. In fact, the industry has been enforcing new rules that urge productions to prioritize representation. Most recently, a rule has been placed that for a film to qualify for a major award, they have to hire a certain number of non-white actors. Gone are the days of all white cast in film and TV. Most shows now can't get greenlit unless they have actors of color in major roles in the cast, which, if you ask me, is about time. I know so many actors who couldn't get auditions who now work full time because their voices are finally allowed to participate. I don't know why the industry is like this. I don't know why society is like this. But hey, they're trying. This is also true for crew members. In the hair and makeup trailers, there's new rules in force that must have black artists available at all times so all actors can have proper hair and makeup before going to set. For pushing diversity in hair and makeup is a good start, but it seems to be the only crew department that's being pushed for more diversity. When you're actually on the floor, you'll still find that most of the crew are white men, especially in departments like camera, electrics, grips, and of course, directors and producers. IAFSI, which is the American Union for Crew Members, has been trying to evoke change. If you go to their website, they actually offer a lot of different programs designed to get more people of color in crew positions immediately. They even have programs where you can shadow someone on set and learn how to do each job as you work. Now, just to be clear, I'm not trying to discredit white men at all here. White men are just as valid, talented, and important as everybody else. It's just that up until five years ago, they were the only people allowed to be in these positions. Advocating for other people isn't an attack on them. It's just an attempt to include minorities who have been who have had to work twice as hard for the same opportunities. In fact, white men can be the leaders in creating change. A white man is statistically more likely to be listened to than anyone else. So use your voice to promote inclusion and diversity. Be allies, we need you. What also is exciting is we're finally seeing diversity like this with the types of roles actresses are now allowed to play. For so long, Hollywood has been operating under an incorrect assumption that men are the default relatable character types that audiences can connect with, while pushing a narrative that female characters are much harder for audiences to relate to or root for. Seriously, think about how many films in the last 50 years have had male leads or mostly male cast but were catered to both genders. Films like Mean Girls, Frozen, and most recently the Barbie movie have proven that this isn't the case, that audiences of both genders will show up and pay to watch female characters as long as they're written with a, from a place of truth and seen like real humans. Barbie took over the world last year, not because we like dolls, but because women got to see their truths being represented accurately. The Barbie movie was the highest grossing film last year. It became Warner Bros' highest grossing film ever, beating things like Harry Potter and Batman. It's the 14th highest grossing film of all time. So it's no surprise that this film has been nominated for Best Film and Best Adapted Screenplay at the Academy Awards. Yet, 
The two people who made this film possible, Greta Gerwig and Margot Robbie, were notably snubbed by the Academy. Really think about that. Greta Gerwig has achieved records with this film. She has achieved a level of success that is impossible for most people, yet was ignored by the category. Similarly for Margot Robbie, we have somehow gone from she's Barbie and he's Jeff Ken to Jeff Ken? How? How is that possible? It's almost as if they wanted to send a message to them that you can be powerful, but not more powerful than the people in charge. Clearly, this message has backfired though, because the only press the Oscars are getting right now is in relation to these women being ignored. It's clear that though the glass ceiling hasn't quite been shattered, there are big cracks in it. So now, more than ever, we need more women writing, producing, directing, and sharing their stories with the world. So, how do we do that? Well, thanks to social media, there's now more opportunities than ever to get your content out there for free. Apps like TikTok, YouTube, Instagram have bigger audiences than even streaming platforms. You now have complete control to get your message out there. If you don't have a professional film camera, you can use your cell phone's camera and still get quality footage. Celebrities don't even need talk shows anymore to advertise their work because they can do it themselves online. Take advantage of that. The internet is your greatest opportunity to get discovered right now. In fact, I've had more people recognize me for my TikTok channel than I have for my film and TV career. If you want to be a filmmaker but don't know how to get in the industry, I suggest you write a script, film it on your phone with artists you know, then post the full film on YouTube and clips of it on TikTok and Instagram. You would be shocked how easy it is to get discovered that way. Don't forget there's also IMDb, which if you don't know, it's kind of like Instagram but for the film industry. You can go on IMDb and look up any, any TV show, any film, any contact, and you will find all of that information right there. As much as people want to fight it, social media is now the biggest audience in the world and your greatest opportunity. We also get opportunities through unions. Actors have SAG, ACTRA, and Equity as their unions. Crew members have IACSI, NAVEB, and the ICG. Now, a lot of artists debate if it's better to be union or stay non-union. Really, there's pros or cons to both approaches. Non-union is content that anyone can make because it doesn't have to follow any kind of guidelines. Because of that, there's a lot more non-union work out there, so it's a great way to build up your resume, network, and grow your craft, especially when you are just starting out. The downside is most non-union work is either non-paying or doesn't pay enough to cover your rent in Toronto. It also means that you can be treated any way on a film set without any repercussions. These are the main reasons that most artists go union. The majority of content you see in a movie theater or on a streaming platform are union productions. A union project has to be approved by ACTRA or SAG or whatever other union and follow their very strict guidelines. This is a good thing because unlike a non-union set, if someone mistreats you, you can call your union and they will contact the producer immediately and have the issue corrected. Being union also means being paid a living wage. On union sets, an actor is guaranteed to be paid anywhere from $32 an hour to $200 an hour, depending on the size of their role. The first union speaking role I ever had, I didn't even have a full line. I only said one word, and I was paid over $2,000 for that. What took me two weeks to earn at a retail job, I'm guaranteed to make more in one day on a union film set. Whereas the most money I've ever made from a non-union film set was $150 for a 14-hour day. Not to mention, union film sets provide you with insurance that covers things like dental treat and prescription medication. Since most of you are young people, you should know that the second you graduate from school, you stop being covered under your parents' insurance. I didn't know that, and let me tell you, the first thing I did when I became a full action member was get my teeth cleaned. 
Also, on a personal note, food on Union Film sets are so much better, and there's so much of it. When I'm working full time on a production, I don't have to go grocery shopping ever. They just give you so much food that you can that you can't even eat it every single day. So you just bring it home with you. I worked on the show for eight months. I think I went grocery shopping maybe twice during that entire period. There was one day I left with an entire container of mashed potatoes and ate mashed potatoes for an entire weekend. It was beautiful. The downside to going union though is you are only allowed to work on union film sets. This can be very limiting because there's fewer opportunities and you're competing against giant celebrities for roles. When I was a non-union actor, I was looking lead roles, no problem. When I went union, suddenly I was auditioning for very small roles. You're also always at risk of not being able to work if your union decides to go on strike, which is what we saw last summer. So there's pros and cons to being union or non-union. You just gotta pick which one is a better fit for you and your needs. Most opportunities that you get on union film sets come from networking. If you're a crew, you very seldom see a union crew job being posted online, and you will most likely book it because someone recommended you for that job. So it's very important to be as kind and professional as possible when you're on set. All you have in this industry is your name. If you get a bad reputation, you're done. You, they won't hire you again. It's so competitive that they can replace you within a day. So you have to be likable and easy to work with. There's no one who tells you this, but being good at your craft is only half of the job. The other half is how easy you are to work with. There's a lot to this because film sets are very high pressure environments. They need people who are able to work hard and not crack under stress. Most film sets or casting directors like to hire the same people over and over again because they know they can be relied on. So it's so important to make connections on set. You gotta be careful though, because film sets can be a lot like high school. They're very clicky and people love to gossip. It can be very toxic very quickly, so be careful. It's always better to listen than to speak because anything you say or do on that set will be used to determine your next job. Rumors get passed around so quickly and people from other shows will call your last show to see if you're worth hiring or not. All you have in this industry is your name. Don't ever forget that. Everyone who works on a union pilot that I produce, I sent them through networking. My director and co-producer AZ was introduced to me by a mutual friend. The majority of our crew were friends I had made on other film sets. People will, all, will always hire their friends first, so make sure you are always giving it 100% when you're on set. Believe me, a good reputation takes years to build, but just one bad day to ruin. This is also why I recommend producing, because then you get to choose who you hire. We had so much fun on my show, why can't you understand me? Because all of our crew were people I genuinely loved, so it was kind of like being at a party all day long. I say if you're not having fun, you're not doing it right. To make it as a self-employed artist, you have to be very driven. Self-employment means there will always be times when you're not working. We've seen this very recently during the pandemic and the union film strike from last summer. So, it's up to you to create your own work in those moments. If I'm not on set, I'm at home writing a script, or posting on social media, or taking a class, or emailing my resume out to anyone I can think of. It's that old saying, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. I've had so much success so quickly simply because I'm always hustling. You have to always be pushing yourself like that because this is one of the most competitive industries in the world. Whether you're an actor or a crew member, the film industry is the Olympics of your trade and you have to approach it as such. You can't be sitting at home doing nothing because you can get a call at any time and you have to be ready to go. That's why I'm such a huge advocate for taking classes and training. The more you develop your craft, the stronger you become. 
My mother, Susan X. Constraints, has been a hairdresser for well over 25 years, but she still takes classes every year to stay sharp and learn new skills. I work full-time in the film industry, but I still take acting classes on the weekend and singing lessons regularly. You have to think of your body as an instrument, and that you need to always keep it in tune, always be practicing, always stay sharp. Now, this is where mental health can affect your career. Your mental health is going to be one of the biggest challenges you face as you pursue a career in the arts. This was something I had no preparation with going into my career. When I started out, acting was my favorite thing in the world and the one thing I was certain I could do perfectly without failing at. It made me happier than anything else in life and that was why I wanted to make it my career. That changed drastically when I went to college for acting. My, my teachers bullied every ounce of joy I had for acting right out of me. I went from being very confident and sure of myself to feeling so anxious and defeated by them that I couldn't even look at a script without crying. That is something that I didn't think I could ever happen to me, but it did. This wasn't just my school though. Almost every actor I've spoken to who went to college or university for acting has echoed this experience. For some reason, a lot of teachers operate under an assumption that they have to break you to make you as an artist. But this couldn't be further from the truth. You can't create art through negativity. You will never take risks through criticism or grow through judgment. It simply doesn't work. I'm still glad I went to college because completing my program gave me my first union credit with ACTRA, and what I learned in two years there would have taken me 10 years to learn on my own, but it damaged my self-worth, and, and it took years to unlearn that damage. The damage I, that was inflicted on my mental health from the school is still something I'm unlearning today. The only real issue I've had as a working actor is desperately trying to believe in myself again after my school took that ability away from me. When I graduated from college in 2019, I seriously considered quitting acting because my school had me convinced that I wasn't good enough to do it. The thing that kept me moving forward though was I didn't have a plan B. I don't know how to do anything outside of the arts, and I don't think I have any other skills I could really fall back on. So I had no choice but to keep going down this path, even if it was a little scary. Strangely though, I found that the film industry was not as threatening as the classroom. I actually booked my first film role before my college graduation, and I didn't even have an agent at the time. That job was more fun than any day I had in the two years of my college program. The film industry was welcoming and kind and exciting. I found that even if I didn't believe in myself anymore, I was having so much fun that for now, that was enough. So I kept pursuing acting and finding success in it. I started working full time as a union actor in 2021 and I haven't stopped since. During that time though, I kept taking classes that people recommended to me. As I said before, it's really important to never stop training. Some classes were really positive. I had great experiences doing improv at Second City and learned a lot from my supportive teacher, Michael Gelman. Brian Levy taught me on-camera acting in a way that made me feel so inspired and motivated that I still maintain a good friendship with him to this day. Other classes, though, were even more toxic than my college program. One teacher, whom I can't even mention because he's very famous, made me feel so worthless and uncomfortable that I didn't take another acting class for two years. That's messed up. You're not supposed to be perfect in a classroom. That's where you go to learn and explore. Teachers should be inspiring you, not making you contemplate giving up. Every issue I've had as a working actor has come from this place of self-doubt. This is the biggest challenge you will ever face as an artist. So 
If you find yourself there now, doubting your talents or your self-worth, I really want you to know and understand that you're not alone. There are so many people who feel the same way you do. Even famous actors I know always get scared before they perform. There's this old joke that they won't unpack their suitcases because they they're expecting to get fired. But you know what? They perform anyways. If they, if they feel scared, they just do it scared. Sometimes you just have to take that leap of faith. When I produced my union pilot for the series I wrote last summer, I was terrified. I didn't think I could be the lead at all, which was so unlike me. But I had to do it. On our very first day on set, I had this huge, huge opening monologue. We had never rehearsed as a crew. No one knew what I was going to do. I remember thinking that I had no idea if this was good or bad. It was simply my interpretation of the monologue, which it was a monologue I wrote, mind you, so probably should have been a bit more sure of myself there. I performed it, and the second our director, Aza, yelled cut, the entire crew started clapping for me. And just like that, I knew that all that self-doubt I had wasn't real. The little girl who knew she was a good actor was still there. She had never left. The validation of every person in that room gave me the confidence to believe in myself for the very first time since going to college. It's a moment that I keep very safe in my heart and pull out whenever the self-doubt creeps out. So what can you do to get rid of that self-doubt? Well, the truth is that inner critic is never going to go away. But what we can do is make our inner cheerleader louder than it. By doing that, we learn to trust the affirmations more than the judgment. Learn to speak to yourself how you would a four-year-old. I know that sounds crazy, but hear me out. You'd never say to a four-year-old, you're worthless, you'll never accomplish anything. But you might say, oh, good try, look at how much closer you were this time. That's how you have to speak to yourself. You have to be gentle and kind. Failing may be scary, but it's necessary to grow. You have to fail to improve. Anyone who is famous, I promise you, they have failed more times than they have succeeded. Each time they fail, they have to ask themselves, okay, what did I learn? What went wrong and how do I fix that for next time? That's the foundation they're building from every single time they perform as an artist. That is where the success lies. When I watched the pilot I produced last year, I feel embarrassed because I wouldn't make those same choices as an actor today. Next year, when I watch all the scenes I acted this year, I hope I feel embarrassed just like I do today. If you're not embarrassed by what you did last year, you're not improving at all. That's why being an artist makes you feel so alive. It's a constant act of courage. Recently, my friend Chelsea shared this quote with me that I'll share with all of you. It goes, dear artists, stand 10 toes deep in your cringe. Do not apologize for taking the necessary steps you are taking towards self-discovery. I thought that was so powerful. And you know, keep in mind, cringe, it's not a real thing. When you're like, oh, I'm so cringy, that's just your idea of what you think someone else is thinking about you. Learn to play as an actor and as an artist. Make it fun, fall in love with it again. Take giant risks. Step into your cringe because your best work is on the other side of it. You have to be so secure in yourself that you don't listen to somebody else's opinion of you. The only opinion that should matter is yours. The last piece of advice I want to leave with you is how to succeed as an artist, but specifically as an actor. It's so simple, it's almost silly, but it comes down to this one concept. Know exactly who you are and bring that to everything you do. If you can do that, 
you are guaranteed to find success as an actor. Your point of view is the one and only thing that you have that no other actor has. It's the reason you book the job over everybody else. If you give the same script to a hundred different actors, I promise you, you will see a hundred different versions of the same scene. It's so incredible. It's because we all have these different perspectives. That's why you can't compare yourself to any other actor, even if it's tempting. You are unlike anyone else. We're all pulling from different experiences and resources. If you don't book a role, it doesn't mean you can't act. It just means the option you gave the casting director wasn't the role, wasn't the option that they were looking for for that role. So the role was never yours to begin with. Just like how the role you do book was meant for you and nobody else because the option you presented was the one they wanted. When we did the casting for my union pilot, Why Can't You Understand Me? I think we must have watched over 100 self tapes from 100 different actors, but we only had 10 spots to cast. Of those hundreds of actors, not one person did a bad job. No one was a bad actor, no one was untalented, they were all really good. The thing is though, the characters we were casting for were extremely specific in my head. They could only be trained one way for me to choose the actor. No one we didn't pick gave bad performances, it just wasn't meant for them. The actors we did cast were so perfect for the character types I was thinking of that no one else could have played them. I couldn't imagine anyone else giving that performance we were looking for. It was perfect for their perspective. So if you don't book a role, you'll book the next one. It's okay. Everybody has a bad day or a less desirable audition. It just means you're human. The actors that didn't make it in their 20s, they make it in their 40s. But what if the actors that made it in their 40s had quit in their 20s? We wouldn't see that potential. You can never give up on your art for that reason. You never know when it's gonna take off. It could happen at any time. We are always growing and changing and learning. You get better with every single experience. Every time I do an audition, it's better than the last one. But if you quit, you just stop there. The growth just stops. It's so worth sticking it out even when it's hard and you're tired and you're not seeing the results you want to, you've got to keep going because you have no idea what the future holds or where it's going to take you. Honestly, I didn't think I would do half the stuff that I've done today. I didn't even know if I was going to be alive today when I think back to where I was at in college. Thank God I am alive though because now I get to live my dream every single day and all of you have that power too. Every single person here has that capability. The only thing you need to succeed as an artist is confidence, hard work, and the drive to never give up. To all the women here today, our journeys are going to be so much harder than anyone else's. It takes so much courage for us to simply survive in a society that doesn't always welcome us. So be brave and stand tall because the world is better and more interesting because of you. Ladies, you must know that your voice is powerful and needed and deserves to be heard. You are worthy of every opportunity that life has and you deserve to chase your dreams and pursue a career in the arts if that is what you so choose. Remember though, when you see other women out in the world, don't be jealous of them, or gossip about them, or show any negativity towards them, even if it's tempting. Every woman you see is battling the same fight you are. It's so important now more than ever for us as women to stand together and lift each other up. If you don't do that for yourself or other women, who will? We have to support other women and each other and ourselves with every fiber of our being. Let me tell you, there is nothing more powerful 
and nothing our society fears more than a group of strong women united by the common understanding that they deserve better. And I want all of you to know that if at any time you feel lost or like you might need an extra push, an extra bit of support, you can always find me on Instagram or on my website. They're both Sadie Strengths, SadieStrengths.com, and I will message you back and do anything I can to make you understand that you are valued and deserve to be heard. My name is Sadie Strengths, and thank you so much for having me today. Thank you.